Hey, and welcome to video blog number eight. Thanks a lot for uh, watching. Uh, once again, for those of you who are new to the video blogs, a lot of the questions that I get asked are the same each and every blog. So you can go to the Motormouth Canada YouTube channel and watch the old ones if you like, uh, because I seem to get the same kinds of questions over and over. Uh, some of the questions I'm getting today are a bit different and that's why I've chosen them. Once again, if you want to get a question in, two ways really are the best. Uh, follow me at Twitter. Uh, it's Driving with Zach, at Driving with Zach is a good way. And also the Facebook page, Motormouth Canada, a lot of people seem to like that because you can watch the videos on there and you can also uh, leave comments and I put some other videos up as well. So that's how you get in touch, that's how you get notifications when the new videos are coming out and to get questions in. All right, let's get to the questions right away. Tony Jin says, I really want a Range Rover V8 supercharged, but I don't have enough budget for the new generation only have enough for the V6 model, that's the new V6 model. I have a tough time choosing between the new V6 and the V8 supercharged, the older one. Please give me some advice. Well, if you don't have enough money for the new V8 supercharged, you probably don't have enough money to keep the old V8 supercharged running. Uh, the thing about Range Rover and Land Rover is they, they still are below industry average when it comes to quality. But on the other end, if you survey Range Rover and Land Rover owners, they love their cars. Yes, they have more problems, but they also have very high uh, customer satisfaction. So I would probably go for the new V6 instead of getting the older V8 supercharged just based on potential problems. The next one comes from uh, Joe uh, Brosif. He says, um, I sent you a message a while back on Twitter wondering uh, if you did a, a Corvette Stingray review. I haven't seen it yet. How's the drivability versus the Hellcat? Did you get some decent time behind the wheel on the track? Well, this is perfect because I just came back from driving the new Corvette on the track in Nevada. And you have to watch the video because I do mention the difference between the new Corvette Z06 or Z07 and the Hellcat, which is actually more powerful. The Corvette Stingray has 650 horsepower and the Hellcat 707 horsepower, but they're very different. So make sure you watch the review. Next one comes from, uh, I can't say the name here. Uh, it says, Zach, I can't choose. Now, if you watch the previous blog I did on, on video blog number seven, I talked about people sending in stupid requests for what car should I buy without giving me any background information. Now this person watched that video blog number seven and actually put together a proper question and here's how it goes. I can't choose between two different vehicles, an Audi A6 three liter turbo, a three liter T I should say, and the VW Touareg TDI. Uh, they're about the same price. I have two young kids, that's good to know and I like to travel on the weekend, that's good to know, and I also enjoy driving. See, these are all salient points to what I need to know if I'm gonna give you information. I'm concerned about the possibility of Volkswagen having the Touareg discontinued in the United States and hurting the value of the vehicle. Could you give me a few points to help me choose which one? I appreciate it. Now that's a proper question. He's got kids, small kids. He likes, they're both the same price and he travels on the weekend and he also likes to drive. Now, I just came out of a Porsche Cayenne into an Audi A7, but my kids are older. They're not little kids anymore. They're um, almost 13 and almost 10. So they're bigger. They can get in and out on their own. Having had a Cayenne in the past, I can tell you that I never used to be an SUV fan until I had a couple with young kids. And there really is uh, no comparison getting in and out of a car with little kids versus an SUV. I personally find the SUV very, very practical for having little kids. Also, they can see out, they don't get sick in the back. You get in a car, you sit lower, the doors are up a little higher and little kids need to see out. Uh, now, if you like to drive, the Audi A6 is gonna definitely be your choice and that three liter T is a wonderful engine, but you can't beat the Touareg TDI for torque and also fuel economy and resale value. Now the thing is, I don't know where you're hearing about Volkswagen discontinuing the Touareg in the United States, so that is, certainly is not the case. Uh, and even if they did, the vehicle would actually hold its value better because there wouldn't be any available in the used market or a whole lot less of them. If it was my money and I had two young kids and you travel on the weekend with the kids, I would take the Touareg TDI. I like, that's a fantastic product. 
coming from a guy who just switched from a Touareg cousin, the Cayenne, into an Audi. So there you go. Brendan Wong says, uh, U.S. uses miles per gallon. We use liters per 100 kilometers. Why not liters per kilometer? I have no idea why we do it that way. It's just the way it is. Everything is marketed and advertised that way, so we're going with liters per 100 kilometers. I don't know why they do it that way. Uh, Republic of Doyle, Canadians buy less expensive cars and keep them longer than Americans. What are the other differences between U.S. and Canadian auto markets? Well, them keeping them longer, I'm not so sure about that. It was the case that Americans used to trade in their vehicles more often, and the average length of a vehicle on the road was younger. But because of the Great Recession that hit in 08, 9, 10, 11, it's continuing to have a ripple effect through the economy. The American car market is quite now a bit older than the Canadian market by a couple of years. Now, the average car on the road, you would think is maybe six, seven years old. It's actually between nine and 11 years old, but that also takes into account older cars that are still registered. So Canadians, here are the differences between the Canadians and Americans when it comes to buying. We're more price averse for the mainline cars that we buy. We buy smaller cars. So the best selling car in Canada is the Honda Civic. But the best selling car in the United States is one size bigger, the Toyota Camry, along with the Accord and the Ford Fusion and others. So we buy compact cars en masse, Americans buy mid-size cars en masse. Same thing with the next biggest category, which is uh, SUVs. We buy Honda CRVs, RAV4s, Ford Escapes, you name it, small SUVs en masse. Americans buy mid-size SUVs en masse. But Americans are starting to come around to the way Canadians think when it comes to these SUVs. A lot more Americans are buying the smaller SUVs because they're not that small anymore. They keep getting bigger. Um, we're much more price averse because we have higher taxes, higher cost of fuel, and um, those are the main reasons. So Canadians uh, buy less expensive cars, but then on the other end of the scale, at the high end of the scale, we buy many more German cars than Americans do. Now, they certainly buy lots and lots of high-end German cars, but per capita, the market share for companies like BMW and Mercedes is higher um, than it is in the United States. Uh, Lexus is a huge brand in the United States, absolutely massive down there. It isn't a very big brand in Canada. It certainly has its followers, of course, but BMW, Mercedes, and Audi, and then it's Lexus and Infiniti, and down you go. And, and really small players in the Canadian market are Lincoln and Cadillac, where in the United States, you go to places like Florida and Texas and what have you, those brands still dominate. So those are some of the differences we have between the two markets. Miko Spud says, and this is another premium car question. Why do some Mercedes BM diehards scoff at the idea of owning an Audi? Um, the Mercedes is for the ride, BMW is for the handling. What is the attractive feature for Audi? Why do people buy Audi products? Now, we're starting to see this change. And typical Mercedes buyers have been older and they're trying to skew that younger with a lot of their smaller new products. BMW diehards have a lot of things going in their favor, performance, luxury, and, uh, and handling. Now, Audi is one of the fastest growing luxury brands in the world, if not the fastest growing. Audi owners are younger, quite a bit younger than BMW and Mercedes owners. They're affluent. They have plenty of money, if not more money. You wouldn't know that, uh, but um, Audi buyers are affluent, if not more affluent than the other two German brands. And they see themselves quite differently. Very similar to the way Saab owners did maybe 20 years ago. They like to drive the, low, the road less traveled, meaning they want to drive a car that says something different than the established brands. I'm more creative, I'm more adventurous, uh, and they're definitely into style and see themselves as entrepreneurial types that want to be different. So that's the overall psychographic of an Audi buyer. But as we have seen over the last 10 years, Audi keeps moving up and up and up the ladder. It's past Lexus here in Canada and is now firmly established as the number three luxury brand. Um, now, here's a correction. Somebody caught on this, and I did make a mistake. In the previous video blog, I was talking about independent rear suspension in the Golf versus somebody asking about the Elantra GT, uh, which one they should buy. And I said, get the Golf because it has independent rear suspension. There is one asterisk next to that, and this person called iDrive um, sent in a message, and it is true. The Golf TDI, the Golf with the TDI engine, 
has a torsion beam rear suspension, all the other Golfs get the independent rear suspension, and that is true because they had to make room for the uh, AdBlue or Urea uh, tank in the back and they had to forego the independent suspension. So good catch, and I did make a mistake on that. Now somebody else was, I'm gonna wrap it up with this thought. Somebody else was uh, calling me out because I asked people to follow me on Twitter. Once again, it's at Driving with Zach and uh, Facebook, the Motormouth Canada, saying you have you know over 17,000 views on YouTube and you have less than 100 people on Twitter, why are you doing that? Well, first of all, there's a couple of reasons. It's easier for me to see all the questions on my Twitter inbox than it is to go and look at them in different areas on YouTube. And um, if I've got 17,000 uh, followers on YouTube, and I don't have that many on, on Twitter, why wouldn't I use those people to help build this number up? And if, for those at the beginning when I talked about starting this video blog, you know, car companies are, are getting much more savvy with um, the people that they allow to drive their products and the influence that people like me have in the marketplace. And they're putting a lot more importance on social media. So this YouTube channel, is fantastic but you need to have all of the you know the bullets in your gun you know facebook twitter i don't have instagram i can't get jazzed about that yet maybe i'll get around to that uh, and so on so that's why it's helping me so please you pay nothing for watching these videos follow me on twitter at driving with zach and go to motormouth canada uh, and that's about it so oh i'm all, i'm going away detroit auto show uh starts on monday be there for that uh, the following week, I'm going to Iceland. Never been to Iceland. Very stoked about that. Going to drive the new Land Rover Discovery. Now, if you have any questions about, you know, these trips that I'm going on, that would be good. Then I'm doing a winter driving program in, in February with, uh, with Chrysler. Another winter driving program with Mercedes-Benz in Quebec. And then the new Kia Sorento. So, if you have any questions for those particular brands, uh, let me know. And those of you who are in the Lower Mainland, uh, that's Vancouver area where I live. I'm starting my new radio show. It's starting um, in two weeks. What's the calendar date? The 24th of January on um, Sea Isle 650. That's 650 a.m. in Vancouver. And it's at 9 o'clock in the morning. But don't worry, all of you out there, I'm going to have a podcast. So that's another reason to follow me on Twitter. I'm going to have a podcast of the radio show, which is going to be more of this kind of thing. And I'll tweet that out and you can listen along. Thanks to everybody. Keep on checking in, keep signing up, and I'll keep making these.